continue talking about the social self. This time, let's talk about the need for self-esteem. Let's begin by defining self-esteem. Self-esteem is essentially an evaluation that you have of yourself. So it's an evaluative self-appraisal. But keep this in mind, the self is multifaceted. Remember we talked about the self-concept and how it's composed of many different self-schemas? So we need to evaluate ourselves on all these different levels. For example, when I think about myself, I think about my physical self and the self-schema that's associated with that. Now I know I'm no George Clooney, but I, I have a relatively positive view of how I look. So that's one way that I evaluate myself. And as, as I'm going through this, you should think about yourself. So another facet of the self, of course, would be like my social self, how I do with other people and my role in society. And even though I'm a social psychologist, in general, I'd rather avoid people. And um, sometimes I feel awkward in social situations like many people. So when I evaluate my social self, sometimes that appraisal is somewhat negative. Now, keep in mind, I'm evaluating myself on many different dimensions, as are you. And it's essentially that sum total that contributes to my overall sense of self-esteem. Now, of course, there are many other self schemas. So I'm going to evaluate myself and you're going to evaluate yourself based on your intelligence, based on how you're doing in school, based on how you're doing in work, um, all kinds of different things because the, the self is multifaceted, as I said. Well, if you think about it over the long term, when we think about our self-esteem over the long term, from childhood all the way through old age, what we're talking about here is your trait self-esteem. That's a relatively stable view of yourself, and it is essentially an overall average of all of those individual self-evaluations that we were just talking about. So that's relatively stable. But as you know, know your self-esteem can go up and it can go down at any given time. So, for example, you might be humiliated at work today, kind of like Kermit the Frog was in this picture right here. And we know that anybody in this situation is not going to be feeling good that particular day. And that's because this person's state self-esteem has really taken a hit. So we're making a distinction here between trait self-esteem and state self-esteem. So another example would be assume that you got an exam back and you realize that you failed it. And now you're really questioning your sense of self-worth when it comes to school and your future career. And that's going to feel horrible. Now, eventually, you'll probably put it into perspective, but at that point, your state self-esteem, your current state of mind, your state self-esteem is really going to take a hit. Well, state self-esteem can fluctuate greatly, as we've been talking about, and particularly if you are overly influenced by praise and criticism. Let's think about that for a second, because it's really pretty important. You probably know some people that hang on other people's every word. And if people have nice things to say about them, they're feeling great and top of the world. And if someone has some relatively negative things to say about them, particularly someone who's close to them, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, then they're just feeling like trash. Those people are very influenced by other people and their state self-esteem is going to go up and it's going to go down quite a bit. It's going to be relatively unstable. But now there are other people, I would say myself included, and probably people who have been around for a while, where, you know, we know ourselves and we know about our strengths and our weaknesses. So there's almost nothing that you can say to me that's going to make me feel so good or so bad because I already have this generally stable sense of myself. So although state self-esteem can fluctuate quite a bit, for some people it's going to fluctuate more than for others. I hope that made sense. I think you get the the sense of the difference here between a stable trait self-esteem that follows us from childhood through old age, and then state self-esteem, which can really fluctuate just even within one day. Let's talk a little bit more about this need for self-esteem. And I want to make it clear, it's not just that we want to see ourselves positively, we really need to see ourselves positively. Because otherwise, life just seems relatively worthless to us. I mean, we need to impose some type of meaning. It has to make sense. And thus, we pursue a sense of self-worth pretty vigorously. So some people might spend a lot of time exercising and trying to look really good because that's one way that they derive a sense of self-worth. 
Some people might spend a lot of time thinking about their career and spend long hours at work and really try to excel there because achievement in life is really wrapped up in their career and that's how they derive a sense of self-worth. Sometimes people are deriving that sense of self-worth from their family. So they might spend a lot of time with their kids. Of course, nothing wrong with that. Um, and then that role of mother or father really defines who they are. Some people are looking very externally and they might be seeking fame because when other people are looking up to them and other people are applauding them, they really feel that sense of self-worth. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about ways that people are vigorously pursuing a feeling of uh, just feeling good, you know, being able to appraise yourself and saying, like, I'm a good person. I feel good. That's what self-esteem is all about. Let's talk about some theories that help to put self-esteem into context. Sociometer theory is really pretty interesting. It's all based on the idea that we're social animals, of course, and we need to connect with other people. So if we are going to be social and live in a society, we have to have a place in that society. And it's our self-esteem that tells us how we're doing. So what I think is kind of neat is to view this, that self-esteem is like a social thermometer. So that when our self-esteem is high, the thermometer is essentially telling us that we have good social acceptance. But when we're not connecting well with others, we're feeling some sort of social rejection and we're going to feel that through our self-esteem. So when we have low self-esteem, it's indicating to us that we're going through some period of social rejection. We're not fitting in right. Things are not going really well. And that indicates some need for us to regain social approval. In other words, we need to make some changes. So when that thermometer is on the low end, something's got to kick in. We need to make some type of changes. And we will talk about that a little bit later on. Some self-esteem maintenance mechanisms. Some things that need to kick in when we need to start feeling better about ourselves. And I was kind of touching upon this a minute ago. Low self-esteem doesn't really feel very motivating. You often feel down in the dumps and like you want to hide. But it's that negative feeling that often makes you realize you need to make some changes. So that's what sociometer theory is all about. And again, self-esteem is working like a social thermometer. Now let's switch gears because there's another theory of self-esteem that's really very different. And it's called terror management theory. And again, we have this need to feel good about ourselves, to have this sense of self-worth. Well, that's kind of tough to do because as human beings, we know what's going to happen later on. You can live a great life and you can feel really good about yourself, but pretty soon you're just going to be dead. And it's that awareness of our inevitable doom that really freaks us out. So how can we cope with that? Well, self-esteem is essentially a mechanism that we have to cope with that inevitable doom, with that horrible feeling that we're going to cease living at some point. And the way that we can cope with that and then have some sense of self-esteem, continue to have a sense of self-worth, is to impose meaning on the world by creating some theories of our own and some stories about how the world works. Now, let's be careful here for a second because I can easily see how some people might be offended by this. But again, it's a theory to help put into perspective where social uh, self-esteem fits into this whole process. So this is where it can get a little bit sensitive, we might completely create this idea that a God exists. And the, the theory would go that by creating an idea that a God exists, we are now imposing some meaning on the world because if we follow his teachings, um, we're going to live a long, happy afterlife by his side. And do you see in that situation, we can live with high self-esteem and feel good about ourselves because it's not like we're living for nothing. Something's going to happen later on. Self-esteem in this sense is acting as a buffer to deal with all that anxiety that we're going to die. Part of it as well would be like um, human superiority over animals. There are lots of different parts to this. I'm just giving you a couple ideas. Human beings might look at animals and think they live, they die. There's nothing to it. It's completely meaningless. But we have personalities and we have souls. So do you see again, we're kind of weaving this story to help us feel better to help us better cope with the idea that soon we're not going to live. So it's all about imposing meaning and um, finding a purpose. So in this sense, terror management theory 
says that self-esteem is providing us with some buffer to deal with this death-related anxiety. So it's really kind of interesting. I encourage you to take some time to think about it. Now, it is true that people who have positive self-images do tend to be happier, healthier, and more successful people. Now, sometimes people have taken that a little bit too far. We need to remember that correlation doesn't prove causation. So if we see a correlation such that people with higher self-esteem tend to be more successful, happier people, um, we could take that a little too far and we can say, look, well, what can we do to raise people's self-esteem? Because if we raise people's self-esteem, they're then more likely to be happy and successful. Now, the reason why I'm saying that could be a little bit going a little bit too far is because what also makes sense and might make more sense is that people who are successful people, they're happy with their situation, and thus they tend to develop a high level of self-esteem. Does it work in reverse? Well, the self-esteem movement has been something that has really taken hold of many schools over the past couple of decades. And the whole goal is to try to increase a child's self-esteem. Because the idea is if we increase their self-esteem, then they are later on going to be happier, more successful people. But that can often backfire, specifically trying to boost somebody's self-esteem by telling them that they're great, for example, can backfire because then people really get caught up in being great. And they often then don't want to put themselves in situations where they could fail because then it's very difficult for them to cope with that failure. Also keep this in mind, people who have a really high inflated sense of self, they can become very conceited. And when they become conceited, they don't think a lot about other people. And those people with very high self-esteem can sometimes be some of the nastiest people around when it comes to dealing with other people in society. So this is a very interesting section of the textbook. Just take a look at it and really just give it some thought. I think just dwelling on it will help you understand it quite a bit. All right, that's about it for this section. We will talk more about self-esteem later on. Um, but that's it for right now, so stay tuned. There's more social psychology coming up soon. Thank you.